Hello and welcome to this video showing you how to compare poems. If you've been watching my videos, you will be familiar with the mnemonic that I use with my students, uh, Bootsy. Uh, and uh, this is what it means. Uh, begin with the beginning of the poems and show how this reveals the poet's viewpoint. Uh, then look at language features. Normally you learn these as SOAP aims. But I couldn't make a mnemonic out of that, so I've turned it to OAP's aims, uh, which is basically analysing a language feature. Uh, do another one if you have time. Um, this advice, T, analyse the title. Um, that's a kind of grade 9 bit of advice. I may get rid of this in the essay I'm going to show you, which is um, a grade 8 one. Uh, she doesn't analyse the title, and it may be that under exam conditions you don't need to, to make that step it might be too time consuming. Uh, you do need to make some kind of structural comparison and always relate that to the poet's viewpoint. That's why they've chosen this particular structure. And then finally, write about the ending of both poems and link those to the poet's viewpoint. Uh, well, let's see what that looks like in a real essay. So she's comparing a bayonet charge and storm on the island and actually whatever the question is you know the wording of the question um she can still pretty much write the same essay on these two poems just adapt adapting the words uh, to fit the question so she begins with the b of bootsy the beginning at the beginning hughes opens with suddenly he awoke and was running which places us right in the middle of the action the adverb suddenly is very dramatic and causes tension as we aren't told what had been going on before. However, the verb awoke implies the soldier was sleeping. This sudden jump into action implies how unpredictable war is. It keeps stopping and starting. The verb running creates a sense of urgency, which in turn creates tension as we don't know what is so important. Perhaps Hughes opens like this to imply how natural war has become. Soldiers wake up ready to fight. It's become part of their every day. And so what this lifts this into um, the top uh, mark, uh, it's not quite 30 out of 30, but in, you know, into the top band, is this looking at the poet's purpose. Uh, don't forget that when you're doing Bootsy. You have to look at the poet's purpose. Uh, you can see how she's integrated her quotations into the sentences, so they've just fit in. Um, and she's made sure that she's used a little bit of subject terminology, such as verb and adverb. Um, this isn't absolutely essential, but it is um, an insurance policy, if you like. Um, you don't get marks for, for actually naming these things, but the examiner's got a kind of mental checklist, um, and they may well need a little bit of convincing about your terminology. So she's played safe and put it in. Oh, look, there's another verb there. Um, I find that a little bit clunky, but I know many teachers are asking their students to put these in as their insurance policy. Okay. Well, the next part of um, the essay structure is to therefore write about the beginning of the next poem. So Hughes wrote the bayonet charge. So her next paragraph will be about storm on the island. And again, it will focus on the beginning. And hopefully at the end of the paragraph, she'll look at the poet's point of view. On the other hand, Heaney begins with we build our houses squat, which is much calmer than the urgency displayed in bayonet charge. So you can see she immediately compares back to the previous paragraph and she uses a connective um, or discourse marker to tell the examiner that she's linking back to the previous poem. Perhaps houses refers to society's mental state. We strengthen our minds during war to be able to cope with the stress and distress of losing family members. Heaney is therefore using Storm on the Island as a metaphor to explore the effects of civil war on Northern Irish society rather than soldiers on the front line. Um, so you'll notice this is a shorter paragraph. Uh, it's in much bigger font here. Um, but the explanation of the poet's viewpoint isn't shorter. That's the bit she hasn't compromised on. Uh, in terms of um, literary vocabulary, 
Um, you'll know from my videos that you need to use tentative language like perhaps which she's doing and you also need to refer to society when you're considering the author's point of view. Um, uh, so that applies to any kind of text you're writing about. It's not just uh, writing about the poems. Okay, next uh, she goes into the OAP's aims part, looking at the language features, and she'll make a, a comment about the Hughes poem and then another comment about the Heaney poem. I've kept both paragraphs here so you can see that um, she has a preferred poem. So this is obviously the one that she knows best and is writing most about. And there she'll, she writes less about the Heaney poem. And that doesn't matter. The examiners aren't looking for uh, an equal balance of writing. They're looking for equal comparisons. In other words, oh yeah, I make a comparison about one poem and then I follow it up with a comparison from the next. Uh, right, let's have a read. Hughes uses the simile sweating like molten iron to describe the soldier. The noun iron is seen as something easily obtained, which perhaps suggests that all soldiers are easy to get hold of or recruit, implying that anyone could be a soldier. By saying that the soldier is sweating like a typical metal, Hughes is again implying that this is very normal for the soldier, which implies we shouldn't be bothered by it, we should accept the regularity and inevitability of war. Then we have the contrast to Heaney. Well, actually, it's not a contrast, it's going to be a similarity. This is similar to Heaney, as he uses senses to imply war is natural, conveyed by can listen to the thing you fear. Now, this statement is very casual. Listen implies that we shouldn't stop our fear. Perhaps Heaney wants us to admit that we are scared, but to do nothing. This implies fear of war is natural, again suggesting war is normal. OK, uh, and let's have another look at the paragraph structure. Well, just like in the first example, the end of the paragraph is where she introduces the poet's point of view. Um, she does that with Hughes. Does she do it again with he uh, Heaney? Whoops, I've missed the perhaps. Yes, she does. And so she's constantly hitting the top of the mark scheme by um, continually going back to the author's purpose. Here, the poet's point of view. And again, hopefully you noticed the, um, the terminology, the simile, the noun, those insurance policies that I talked about. You'll have noticed the embedded quotations and again, the tentative language. And... Uh, the final thing is you'll see that she never really uses the word shows. She's really fond of the much more formal implies. Okay, well, Bootsy has two O's in it. Um, so another OAP's aims, OAP's aims. So more language features. And again, she's going to name them. So in the first paragraph, it will be alliteration. And in the second uh, poem, and therefore in her second paragraph, it will be the oxymoron. So Hughes uses the repetition of harsh-sounding harsh alliteration, cold clockwork, to introduce the soldier's fear. Although this war is natural for him, just like clockwork, he is still frightened of it, which begins to imply that Hughes is agreeing with Heaney that fear of war is natural. The harsh sound references the sounds the soldier would be hearing, those of bombs and gunfire, which create the setting of the war field for the reader. Heaney uses the oxymoron exploding comfortably to again imply that war is natural, but rather than being unpredictable, like in bayonet charge, it's a constant thing. And this makes war seem like something society has become accustomed to, even though Heaney earlier implied we have to prepare our minds for it. Uh, so here, she's included the author's point of view in a slightly different uh, place. Um, so here it's in the middle of that paragraph, and she's kept it uh, at the end of this paragraph. Um, she's not penalised for that. It's still the job of the paragraph to compare uh, both poems and both poets' point of view. Um, so it doesn't matter that she's placed that at the beginning of the paragraph. But I've highlighted it for you so you can see it's still there. She's still sticking to the Bootsy method 
and therefore still getting top marks. Okay, well, she's ditched the T of Bootsy because she's written quite a lot and doesn't have time to write about the title, and that's not a problem. But she knows she must write about the structure. Um, now, she doesn't do this very well, and I think this is what costs her at least one mark out of the 30. But she still gets credit for trying to write about the structure. Uh, let's have a look at what she does. Hugh's poem consists of three octaves, which again implies the normality of war as the structure of the poem never changes just like war. It always stays the same. Uh, this is the kind of um, point that's a bit of a stretch really um, and she'll probably get the benefit of the doubt here. She's using the appropriate vocabulary. An octave is eight lines. Um, she's completely in charge of using the right vocabulary but really does it actually imply that um, war is unchanging just like the poem? Well the examiner will give the benefit of the doubt um, but here she goes a little bit too far. On the other hand Heaney uses enjambment to explain the same point. The enjambment could represent the constant bombs that attack the country but as this is constant it doesn't affect us. Um, that's really a made up point. You can't really link uh, the use of enjambment um, to that. Um, now she might be able to with further explanation um, but we can't guess what's in her head um, and so that's not a completed comparison really. Uh, she gets credit for actually understanding what she's talking about but not for making that clear to the reader um, and that nearly always happens when students write about structure. Um, they, they make a, a reference that doesn't fully explain actually why the poet did structure the poem that way. So if I were to jump into her head, she's really making the point that with these run-on lines, the action doesn't stop. You keep going from one line to the to the next uh, without the pauses where you expect them. And this might be to mimic how um, the threat of bombs in Northern Ireland is constant and will appear unexpectedly. Um, so your life never feels quite in rhythm or quite at ease. So she could have developed that point a little further and got uh, more credit for it. Okay, now we come to the ending of the poem, uh, which has got a rather powerful conclusion, I think, when it's um, about Hughes's poem and a less powerful um, conclusion about Heaney's. And that's why she, again, drops a mark and doesn't get full marks. Let's have a look at how Hughes's poem goes well. However, both poets change their opinions with the last lines. Remember I said when you look at the ending, it's the change that you're looking at. And she has completely remembered that, which is going to give her a sophisticated argument. Hughes uses a metaphor, this terror's touchy dynamite, to show that we need to do something to stop war as it is becoming so natural that it's conditioning the soldiers to become walking, talking, killing machines. Um, so the conditioning part is absolutely spot on. Uh, this is slightly nonsense. Um, the soldier doesn't kill anything in this poem, at least that we know about, and he's definitely not talking and he's not walking. Um, so be be more specific with your language. Perhaps again the conditional, uh, sorry, the tentative language. Perhaps dynamite is used to imply how intense the soldier's fear is. That works brilliantly, doesn't it? And because he has to hide it for war to be natural, when he lets his fear out, it would explode and kill him. Um, if she'd left it there, the examiner would be thinking, I'm not really sure what you mean, but she gives a very good explanation here. This may be representing post-traumatic stress disorder, which is seen in many soldiers. Um, so the conclusion is good because it gives the final um, poet's point of view. If you've watched my videos on how to write a conclusion, uh, you'll know that uh, she also needs to make some point about society. Um, so it could be an attack on society uh, for presenting war as heroic and therefore encouraging soldiers to fight, whereas actually the true horror of war means that we shouldn't 
be encouraging soldiers to fight. Um, so that kind of social analysis would give it top marks. Let's have a look at the Heaney comparison. Heaney, however, finishes with Strange. It's a huge nothing we fear, which is ironic, as he has just explained horrific things such as bombs and death, then refers to it as nothing. Perhaps this is to calm readers, to almost stop them being scared by the war. He wants us to accept it for what it is. Um, so this is a bit general. Well, what is it that he wants us to accept? To be more specific about society, um, she needs to make a point that it's Northern Ireland he's writing about, um, where Catholics and Protestants are fighting a guerrilla war, a terrorist war against each other. Um, and uh, the nothing is actually a comment on the cause of that war. He's actually saying that there is nothing to fear. Our differences are much less important than our similarities. We're, we're, we're Irish, we're Northern Irish, uh, we're British, and uh, we believe in the same God. Uh, why are we fighting over nothing? Uh, uh, you know, that's really the point of the poem. And had she made that more explicitly, she would have got 30 out of 30 instead of 28. However, if we go down and look at the Bootsy method, she's followed it perfectly, which is why she's got such high marks, even with those errors in the, in the answer. And the final thing that I'd like to say is, because she had this mnemonic, this structure in mind, um, she didn't have to plan her answer to the poem at all. She just knew where she was going to go. She knew which um, quotation she was going to use. And that made her revision that much easier. Uh, she knew she had to remember four quotations for each poem, basically. One from the beginning, two language features, and one from the ending. Uh, and boom, there you go. You, you only need four quotations to answer the exam paper and get a grade eight. How cool is that? Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, please let me know if you found it useful in your comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you want more.